ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the annual lecture of the Longevity Forum, the closing event of our Longevity Week 2020. After the extraordinary events of this year, our theme, The Age of Resilience, has captured the imagination of our partners who through their tireless work have contributed to our collective resilience, both health, economic, and social resilience. On behalf of my co-founders, Andrew Scott and Jim Mellon, I would like to thank you all for your support for the, for, for the work of the forum. Professor Sarah Gilbert has become a household name for many who follow the scientific efforts toward finding a COVID vaccine. Her leadership in this area, but especially her career long dedication to combating deadly pathogens with pandemic potential made her a natural choice for our person of the year 2020. Lord Neil Mendoza, Provost of Oriel College will introduce Sarah but before I hand over, I also wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge the work that Oriel College, which this year launched the Mellon Longevity Science Program, the first of its kind in the UK, led by Professor Lynn Cox, is doing in helping the most vulnerable in society by advancing research into health resilience in aging populations. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, Dafina. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Provost at Oriel College, as Dafina said. And as a college, we are so delighted to be closely involved with the Longevity Forum. And we are doubly honored this evening to be able to extend a virtual welcome to this year's presenter of the annual lecture, the Longevity Person of the Year. Professor Sarah Gilbert, Professor of Vaccinology in the Nuffield Department of Medicine at the University of Oxford. She is also the co-founder of Vaxitech. I'm certain there's not a person on the planet who doesn't know that Professor Gilbert is currently involved in vital world leading work in her role as Oxford project leader working on a COVID-19 vaccine. Professor Gilbert completed her undergraduate studies at the University of East Anglia and her doctoral degree at the University of Hull and following four years as a research scientist at the biopharmaceutical company Delta Biotechnology, she joined Oxford University in 1994 and became part of the Jenner Institute when it was founded in 2005. Her chief research interest is the development of viral vectored vaccines that work by inducing strong and protective T and B cell responses. She has worked on vaccines for many years on different emerging pathogens, including influenza, Nipah, MERS, Lassa, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, and of course, our very own coronavirus. And working with colleagues in the Jenner Institute Research Labs, the Clinical Biomanufacturing Facility, and the Center for Clinical Vaccinology and Tropical Medicine, all here in Oxford, she is able to take novel vaccines from design to clinical development with a particular interest in the rapid transfer of vaccines into manufacturing and first in human trials. So I'm now gonna hand over to Professor Gilbert with many thanks for so generously giving up your time in what must be a reasonably intense period for you. We are all cheering on the amazing work of you and your team. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, you're, you're correct that we are working very hard on this vaccine, myself and a large team, team here in the Jenner Institute and at the Center for Clinical Vaccinology and Tropical Medicine. And day to day, we're just involved in getting on in the work and not really thinking about the response to what we're doing in the wider world. Uh, so it's somewhat sobering to hear um, an outside view of what we're doing. Um, but I'm very happy to be able to speak to you this evening uh, and deliver this lecture for the Longevity Forum. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides and tell you about what I've been doing, uh, not only this year, but in the years leading up to that. So where do emerging pathogens come from? They don't just arise out of nowhere. They don't just suddenly come out of the air and start to cause disease in people. Most of the time they're hiding out in some livestock species or other. Sometimes these are um, livestock species that we um, have as farm animals. Sometimes they're other um, uh, organisms such as bats that we rarely come into contact with, but can harbor many different diseases that sometimes spill over into human populations. And this kind of thing happens many, many times every year. And most of the time it doesn't result in any um, ongoing infection, but occasionally a virus that's been hiding away in some veterinary species for some time will suddenly develop the ability not only to infect humans, but to transmit well between humans. And that's when we have um, 
an emerging infectious disease that can start to cause a problem. And obviously we've seen that on a very large scale this year. This is not something that comes as a, as a surprise to those of us who study this kind of diseases, but it is something that um, most of the general public haven't really thought about. This graph just shows you the number of um, zoonotic infections uh, between the years of 1940 and 2000. There are many every year that spill over into um, human populations from wildlife and um, uh, farm animal species. Um, and most of the time, as I say, this doesn't really cause a major problem, but just occasionally there's a potential for something very much larger. So I want to take you back to the year 2014, when I'm sure you will remember there was a large outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. Now, this is not a new virus. This is not something that we've never encountered before. It was first identified in 1976 by Peter Piot, who's now at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And since 1976, there have been outbreaks of Ebola more or less every year, mostly in West Africa. But they've been small outbreaks, um, in mostly in very rural areas. And uh, they've been contained by the classical methods of contact tracing, quarantine, um, keeping those who are infected away from those who aren't. And Ebola uh, does have the advantage if you're doing contact tracing that people are symptomatic before they come infectious. So if you can identify the people who have symptoms of Ebola virus infection, you can keep them away from the rest of the population while they recover. And um, you can stop the outbreak happening in that way. But in 2014, uh, things didn't go according to that plan. In 2013, actually, probably December 2013, a child was infected after playing um, around a tree where there were some bats who'd been infected with Ebola, and it started to spread in the community and gradually spread further. And the defining characteristic of this outbreak was that the disease reached very highly populated areas. So instead of being in a rural area where it could easily be contained, suddenly it was in an area with large numbers of people, lots of transport between different countries, different cities, and it started to really spread like wildfire. And although this was a disease that we've known about for many years, and in fact had been concerned about the use of Ebola possibly as a bioterrorist weapon, um, which had uh, led to some vaccine development, there wasn't a vaccine available in 2014 that could be used to stem this outbreak. And towards um, the end of 2014, the number of cases which had been rumbling on uh, with very little attention being paid to those suddenly started to explode. And we had cases not only in Guinea, which is where the outbreak started, but in the neighboring countries of Sierra Leone and in Liberia. Um, and this was spreading very much out of control. So it was in the August of that year that I was contacted and asked if I would take part in a, a project to do some very rapid vaccine development against the Ebola virus. Now, because of the US bioterrorism program, there were some vaccines that had been through the early stages of vaccine development and were almost ready to go into clinical trials, but not quite. Uh, there was a, a large amount of virus that needed to put into individual vaccine vials, um, and we made arrangements for that to happen. But then that vaccine had to go into clinical trials and it used an adenoviral vector vaccine, not the one that we now use in Oxford, but a different one called CHAD3, Chimpanzee Adenovirus 3. And this was owned by a small company in Italy called Akiros, who was subsequently bought out by GSK. And they'd been working with the National Institutes of Health in America to, to develop this vaccine. And it had been tested in some non-human primate studies and shown that when the monkeys were vaccinated and then exposed to Ebola, even after a single dose of this vaccine, they were protected against Ebola. So the plan was to accelerate clinical testing of this vaccine. Now, CHAD3 at that time had only been used in one clinical trial anywhere in the world, and that was in Oxford. That was in a project to develop a vaccine against hepatitis C virus, which was um, in Oxford run by my colleague, Ellie Barnes. And um, the MHRA, the regulatory authority in the UK, had approved that clinical trial and it had taken place and data on the safe use of that vaccine in humans had been generated. So it was thought that the fastest way to get the CHAD3 Ebola vaccine into clinical development and start testing in humans ready to go into a, um, trials in West Africa where it was really needed would be to work in Oxford. Uh, we have a clinical trial center where we can uh, recruit and vaccinate volunteers. And we have a lot of experience in working with the regulatory and the ethical committees who give approvals for these type of clinical trials. 
So we arranged to have the vaccine put into vials ready for its final use in humans, and we applied for permission to start this clinical trial. And uh, we were able to go ahead with a phase one trial in Oxford, which started in the middle of September of 2014. And this was in, to include 60 volunteers, healthy volunteers, and the aim was to quickly get the data on safety and the immune response to this vaccine in the Oxford volunteers, and then provide the data to another clinical trial site in Mali in West Africa, which was not actually one of the most affected countries in the Ebola outbreak, but it was bordering onto them. And healthcare workers in Mali needed to be prepared to deal with the outbreak should it spread into Mali, which it did in a small way, but it didn't really take off in that country. In parallel with our clinical trial activity, Acairus with GSK ramped up the manufacturing of this vaccine so there will be plenty of doses ready to use in West Africa if our initial clinical trials were su successful. So our aim was to get the safety data in um, 60 volunteers in Oxford and 80 in Mali. They were healthcare workers and we wanted to see that the immune response would be similar to that immune response in monkeys that had protected them against Ebola infection. And then that would lead into a decision on whether to deploy this vaccine in efficacy trials in West Africa, which we had hoped would then start in December of 2014, again, mainly targeting healthcare workers. And this is important for two different reasons. One is that many healthcare workers in West Africa in 2014 lost their lives to Ebola. And it's obviously vital to be able to protect this population so that they can do their really important work without putting their own lives at risk. But also we know that in outbreaks, healthcare workers are often uh, unwittingly responsible for spreading infection. When they go from one patient to another, if they're infected themselves, they can carry the infection with them. So there are two reasons for wanting to be able to vaccinate healthcare workers first before deciding whether to deploy the vaccine more widely. And this was the timeline for our trial. So the grant application was submitted in the middle of August um, and it was fully awarded by the 26th. This is absolute record time. This is a process that can normally take about a year to get funding for a, a clinical trial. Um, the vaccine had to be filled into its final vials. That happened at the end of August. We submitted a, um, our clinical trial application to the UK regulator at the MHRA on the 2nd of September. We went to an ethics meeting on the 5th of September. We had ethical approval three days later and regulatory approval the day after that. Again, very, very rapid time, timings. These are things that would normally take several months, but both the Ethics Committee and the Regulatory Authority prioritized reviewing our applications. There was a special Ethics Committee meeting just for us. Um, and as soon as we had any information on the vaccine, it was provided to the regulator. So when they had the last pieces of the picture, they were able to give full approval very quickly. The vaccine was shipped to Oxford um, on the 11th of September. The labels were put on on the 15th. This is not a trivial process. It's not really, it's not simply just attaching a label to the vial. It can only be done when all of the approvals for the trial are in place and um, everything has been prepared, ready to go ahead. Um, the last thing to happen was the contract to, um, to carry out this clinical trial. So the regulators, the ethical committee, the scientists, uh, the vaccinologists had all moved heaven and earth to get this process uh, running as quickly as we possibly could, but we still had to wait for the lawyers to do their bit before we could get the contract and go ahead and start the clinical trial. And the first vaccination was given the following day, and by the 18th of November, just over a month later, we had our 60 vaccinees in Oxford. We had the safety data, we had evidence that we were getting a good strong immune response to this vaccine, and it was ready to move on to clinical development in West Africa. And the trials in Mali and the healthcare workers immediately started uh, and they went very quickly. And we then expected to see this vaccine used in West Africa in the outbreak area. What actually happened was that there was a very long delay uh, to our mind in, in being able to start these trials. There was a lot of discussion about the best way to run the efficacy studies. Um, would it be ethical to have a placebo controlled trial should it be what's called a step wedge design where you start vaccinating some people and then vaccinate other people's later on. But that turns out to be quite a complicated type of trial to analyze. Um, in the end, the decision was taken to go ahead with a ring vaccination trial where you identify each case and the contacts of that case and the contacts of those contacts. And that defines a ring of people. And then some rings were randomized to receive immediate vaccination and some received vaccination three weeks later. So everybody who was enrolled into the clinical trial did receive the Ebola vaccine. Nobody received a placebo, but some people had to wait three weeks for their vaccine. 
uh, and this was deemed the best way to test this vaccine. While all those decisions and discussions were going on, what was happening was that the case incidence was declining. It had remained fairly flat in Guinea, but then decreased. In Liberia, it had peaked, but then by the end of March, when we were ready to start the efficacy trial, it had really dropped by a long way, and also in Sierra Leone. This was not due to vaccination. This was due to contact tracing, quarantine, the standard methods for containing outbreaks. The net, net result of this was that when the vaccine trials did start in the outbreak areas, there were very few cases left. It was only possible to test one vaccine for clinical efficacy, and it wasn't the CHAD3 vector vaccine that we'd worked on. It was a different vaccine. Fortunately, it did turn out to have very high efficacy, and it was then licensed for emergency use. But that vaccine has some other characteristics, which mean it's not ideal for use in West Africa, where the ambient temperatures are obviously very high. The vaccine that was licensed was um, a so-called BSV vector vaccine. It requires ultra low temperature storage. Um, minus 80, which makes it difficult to use, uh, difficult to ship, difficult to store, difficult to deploy in vaccination settings. Whereas we knew that the CHAD3 vector vaccine developed by Akaros with GSK doesn't require ultra low temperature storage and might actually have been a more effective vaccine to use in this population. But because it took such a long time to start the efficacy trials of these vaccines, only one vaccine ever got tested and CHAD3 was never licensed. Uh, for use against Ebola. Now, this was not any one person or one organization's fault. It's um, a symptom of the fact that the world wasn't really ready to respond to an outbreak of this type. We were able to do some parts of the work very quickly, uh, but other parts of the work that required global coordination and a lot of decision making didn't really happen at the speed that we would like to have seen. And so it wasn't possible to do the vaccine development in the time that would have meant it could have had a real impact on this outbreak. So this led many people to start to think about how we could do things better in the future, how we could be better prepared, have better planning put in place so that we didn't have these delays in time for the next outbreak. And in Oxford, we've been developing our own CHAD vector vaccine, which we now call CHADX1. Uh, and this is a so-called platform technology. That means we can use this technology to make vaccines against lots of different pathogens. The basic technology is the same each time. We understand how to manufacture it, how to test it, what the dose should be, what the side effect profile is going to be. We know how to store it, how to ship it, and all of those things. And the one thing that we need to do to make a vaccine against each individual disease is to add a gene that encodes the antigen that we want to have the immune response against. So CHADOX-1 is a so-called non-replicating simian adenoviral vectored vaccine. So an adenovirus is a virus that would normally cause a mild respiratory tract infection, a common cold. But we have used an adenovirus that normally circulates amongst chimpanzees rather than humans. And this is important because if we started our vaccine development with a common human adenovirus, we would find that quite a lot of the population already have antibodies against that adenovirus. And that reduces the ability of the vaccine vector to introduce strong immune responses when we use it in those people. Whereas the adenoviruses that normally circulate, circulate in chimpanzees, although they're very similar to the human adenoviruses, they haven't infected humans and none of us have antibodies that will interfere with the immune response against our vaccine. Now, in order to make this safe to use as a vaccine, we've taken out some of its genes, the E1 gene and the E3 gene. And the E1 gene in particular, removing that means that this virus can't spread. It can't cause an infection that spreads through the body after we vaccinate people with it, which the original adenovirus would have been able to do. So it's very safe to use, even in people who have a weakened immune system. However, because it is a live virus, it will infect human cells after we vaccinate somebody with it, and it will express the antigen that we've put into that vaccine. In the case of the NCOV-19 vaccine, the novel coronavirus vaccine, what it does is to make very large amounts of the coronavirus spike protein that is normally found coating the surface of the coronavirus. Um, and that's where we want to get the immune response directed to. So the, because the vaccine antigen is encoded in the viral genome and the protein antigen is only produced after vaccination, that means that it, it's not any part of this virus that we are manufacturing to make the vaccine. So all of them are the same. That means we can have a standardized manufacturing technology that we use to make all the Chadox-1 vectored vaccines. It doesn't matter whether it's against 
uh, SARS-CoV-2 or MERS or NEPA or LASA, the manufacturing is the same. So understanding all of these things about the technology that we're going to use before we know what we're going to use it for means we can get off to a really fast start. Um, because it's live, it induces, it induces very strong B and T cell responses, so these antibody responses as well as the cytotoxic T cell responses, and that means we've got both arms of the immune system engaged. The antibodies can neutralize uh, individual viruses and stop them infecting cells, and the T cell responses can seek out and destroy cells that have been infected by the virus and kill that cell and prevent the virus from spreading any further. And working together, those two parts of the immune system give us a very protective immune response. But before April of 2020, we'd conducted 12 different clinical trials, phase one studies with Chalitz-1 vectored vaccines. So we'd already had a lot of information about the safety, about the dose to use, and about the likely immune response we can get. So again, we know a lot about this technology before we start to use it to make a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. And that enables us to get off to a very fast start. Now we've been using this to make a number of different vaccines. And this was our status slide from the end of 2019 where here we have a list of pathogens that are capable of causing outbreaks or pandemics. And for all of them, we've made the initial vaccine. We'd shown that it was immunogenic in the majority of cases. We'd shown we can get neutralizing antibodies. And for all of this work, we have to bring in funding. So it gets more expensive as you move to the right of this slide. We had shown that the vaccines were effective in many cases by immunizing and then exposing animals to the particular pathogen. And some of them had been funded to go into GMP manufacture. So this is the very highly controlled manufacturing that we need to do to make a vaccine before we can start our clinical trials. And some of these vaccines had already been into clinical trials. And our aim was to move all of these vaccines for the different pathogens through this process and be able to know that we had candidate vaccines against all of these diseases that we could take forward when in future when there was an outbreak. But of course, we also had to think about the unknown outbreak pathogen, disease X, as, it's, as it became known. What are we going to do when we have uh, a new disease emerging and we need to make vaccines very quickly? Well, fortunately, the technology that we use is very adaptable and um, we're able to take any gene from a new virus, put it into our Chalix-1 vector and rapidly get into manufacturing and then into clinical development. And that's what happened earlier this year. But before I talk about that, I'm going to tell you about a few of the other diseases we've been working on. One of them is Rift Valley Fever. This affects um, mainly sheep, cattle and goats. Uh, it's originally isolated in the Rift Valley in Kenya, but it's now spread all over Africa and into the Middle East. It can also infect camels and camels are used as a means of transport and they can travel very long distances. And that's important because it means that it can take the virus with them and spread the outbreak over a wider area. And then the people who are looking after these animals um, become exposed to the disease and they can also be infected. So in young animals, there's a very high mortality rate. There's a lower mortality rate in adult animals, but for pregnant animals, there's a very high abortion rate. So what happens when flocks of sheep who are pregnant at the same time become infected is that the vast majority of them will lose their lambs in so-called abortion storms. And thus, this has huge economic effects for the farmer because it means that that year there will be very few surviving lambs born from their flocks. And when humans uh, become infected, um, the case fatality rate is greater than 30%. So greater than 30% of people who are infected will die and they can have debilitating long-term effects. It's transmitted by mosquito species, but it's not fussy. There are many different mosquito species that can carry this around and it also gets transmitted by direct contact with infected animals. It can be quite a difficult disease to, to track down, um, but when it crops up, it causes major economic damage and major health problems for the people living in the area. So my colleague, George Warimwe, who is now based in Kenya, had used Chadox-1 to develop a Rift Valley fever vaccine and had tested it in cattle, sheep, and goats. And these are the survival graphs for um, these three species that have been vaccinated with the vaccine and then exposed to Rift Valley fever virus. And in, in the animals who didn't receive a vaccine, they all died within three to four days of being exposed to the, to the virus. But um, the animals who'd received a licensed vaccine, which is in use in Africa, called the smith fern vaccine, um, the majority of them survived. But when George used the Chadox-1 Rift Valley fever vaccine, in all cases, 100% of the animals survived. 
And George has gone on to show that the vaccine is both safe and effective in pregnant sheep and goats, and is now in the last stages of preparing this vaccine for clinical trials. So this is what we call a One Health approach to vaccinology. The same vaccine can be used to vaccinate the livestock and the humans who may be infected from the livestock. The same seed stock is used. The actual manufacturing of the vaccine for humans will use higher quality materials for, for those than those used for the veterinary vaccine, but it's essentially the same vaccine. And developing a vaccine against humans and their livestock at the same time allows us to have some efficiency and cost reduction and make better progress to having vaccines available. It can also be thermostabilized. So unlike the Ebola vaccine that needed minus 80 temperature storage, we're able to take this vaccine uh, and put it through a special formulation process and then store it at temperatures of up to 45 degrees for six months and then um, liquidize the vaccine again, add water to it. Uh, it's a dry formulation that it's stored in and then vaccinate cattle and show that even vaccines stored at 45 degrees for six months were still highly immunogenic. Um, and so this would, cope with most conditions where um, the vaccine is likely to, ha to have to be stored long term. It's also stable to um, freezing and thawing, which is another major cause of loss of some of the viruses, or some of the vaccines rather, that are normally stored at refrigerated temperatures. If they become accidentally frozen, they can lose potency as well. So another disease that I work on is Nipah. This is a highly pathogenic uh, virus which is found in bats and occasionally causes small outbreaks in Asia. Um, it can also infect pigs. In fact, it was first identified in Malaysia when it had infected pigs and humans became infected from exposure to the pigs. Most of the cases are now in Bangladesh and this is a disease with a very high fatality rate. Anything up to 75% of people who are infected with this virus will die from it. The animal reservoir is fruit bats and these live in trees and tend to congregate around the fruit that humans may be um, eating as well and people can become infected. So a related virus to Nipah is, is, is the Hendra virus, very similar virus from the same family. And Hendra virus had been causing infections in horses in Australia. And then sometimes people had been uh, getting Hendra virus infections from the infected horses. Um, but a vaccine was registered in 2015 for use in the horses. Um, and this has now really reduced the number of cases of Hendra, both in the horses and in people um, in Australia uh, through the use of this vaccine. So now we have a licensed vaccine against Hendra that we can use in horses, but we still don't have a vaccine against the very closely related virus Nipah to use in humans. So we started using our Chaddox-1 vectored vaccine to make a vaccine against Nipah as well. And in this experiment, what we're doing is vaccinating hamsters, either with one or two doses, and then exposing the hamsters to Nipah virus. And we see that the hamsters who haven't been vaccinated succumb to the infection very quickly, they lose weight, and then they die within um, 10 days of being infected. But all of the animals who are vaccinated um, continue to slowly gain weight after they've been exposed to the virus, and they uh, remain protected from the infection. And this uh, graph at the bottom shows you that we weren't able to isolate any live Nipah virus from the animals that have been vaccinated prior to exposure to Nipah virus. So in hamsters, at least, this is a very effective vaccine. We've now tested it in African green monkeys, which is the model of choice for um, Nipah, and it's completely protected in, in those as well. And I'm now in the process of applying for funding to manufacture this and um, initiate clinical trials of the Chalice 1 Nipah vaccine, which we hope will be starting around about this time next year. Another virus that I work on is Lassa fever virus. Uh, this is another virus found in West Africa. This time the host is the multimammate mouse. And this is a, a, a rodent that likes to live around the areas where humans live. It tends to um, live around rubbish dumps or creep into people's houses and trying to find food. And it can contaminate people's houses and the areas they live. And people then get infected with Lassa virus um, after exposure to these, uh, to these mice. And you can see the hot spots in West Africa where this disease is found. Um, now, as with many of these diseases, these areas are increasing year on year. And we see more cases of Lassa infection. It's particularly a problem in Nigeria where there are many, many cases. And it's a real problem in pregnant women who are often more susceptible to viral infections than they would normally be if not pregnant. Um, and healthcare workers who are then looking after the pregnant women uh, quite frequently become infected with Lassa virus as part of their, um, 
the process of caring for these women. And so we really need a vaccine to protect the healthcare workers and to protect the general population against Lassa fever virus. Um, and again, we made a Chalix-1 vectored vaccine. We tested it this time in guinea pigs. Uh, we vaccinated them, we exposed them to the Josiah strain of Lassa fever virus. And we showed that the animals who'd been vaccinated prior to challenge were completely protected, whereas the animals that hadn't been vaccinated were not. But Lassa is a slightly more complicated virus to make uh, vaccines against um, because there are multiple lineages of it. Now, so far we know about lineages one, two, and three, which are found in Nigeria, uh, lineage four in other parts of West Africa, there's now lineage five uh, and a proposed lineage six. And these lineages are genetic variants of the Lassa fever virus. And so it's important that when we go into our vaccine development, we're able to make vaccines that can protect against all of these different lineages, whether they're found in Nigeria, in Mali, in Togo, in Guinea, and so on. And so this is something that we will be doing more of in preclinical studies to make vaccines with different Lassa antigens and then test them to see if we get protection against all the variants of Lassa virus that are out there, because um, it was, is not going to help us if we have um, a vaccine that will only protect against one of these lineages when we probably have at least six of them that we need to make vaccines for. So the next steps for, steps for that vaccine are to um, continue with uh, a non-human primate vaccine efficacy study and then prepare our seed stock ready for GMP manufacturing. And this is work that's going on in parallel with NEPA vaccine development or a, a few months behind. Uh, and once we've manufactured our first batch of vaccine for clinical trials, we'll do our so-called first in human study, uh, most likely in Oxford, starting as we always do with healthy adults who don't have any antibodies to Lassa virus, looking at safety and immunogenicity, and then moving into trials in West Africa in healthy adults again, but some of these will have ex been exposed to Lassa virus before, and then gradually increasing the age range uh, and the number of countries that we recruit into these trials. Um, and then we need to do specialized toxicology studies before we can extend the trial into pregnant women. But for Lassa fever, this is a very important group to look at vaccination for. Uh, and eventually we hope to move into a phase three trial where we will demonstrate vaccine efficacy um, as well as safety and immunogenicity. So these plans have been in place for a while now and been, we've been gradually moving through the process of developing these vaccines. And another one that we work on is MERS, which is a coronavirus Middle East respiratory syndrome. Um, which is um, a very close relative, obviously, of the SARS coronavirus vaccine. So I've been working on this vaccine, which infects camels, and most of the camels in the Middle East are now infected, and they can transmit virus to humans. Um, and it tends to be older people who get the severe infections, uh, so this may be starting to sound rather familiar. And we've been working on a Chadox-1 vector vaccine against the MERS coronavirus. We'd completed our first round of GMP manufacturing. We completed our first clinical study and we'd shown that the vaccine was safe um, and we got strong immune responses. And we were then starting to move into further phase one studies in Saudi Arabia, which is the major geographical region that's affected by the MERS coronavirus. But then SARS-CoV-2 came along. And um, at the beginning of the year, I was looking at uh, details of uh, SARS-like pneumonia cases in Wuhan in China and thinking that this might be a good example of disease X. Didn't know if it was going to spread, didn't know if it was going to um, cause a large outbreak or would be very quickly contained, but decided it would be a good demonstration project to show how quickly we could make a vaccine using our technology and get it ready for clinical testing. And it turned out that it was a very good decision to, to start on this process because you all know the story now, the disease spread, this um, yellow graph shows you the expansion in the number of cases over the timeline during which we were preparing the first um, batch of vaccine for clinical trials, getting our immunogenicity results in animal models, first of all, um, the pandemic being declared, uh, we got our approvals to start um, testing the vaccine in humans. And we started our first vaccinations on the 23rd of April in Oxford in healthy young adults. And this was 104 days after the sequence had been released um, from China. This is not necessarily the fastest that anybody can go to develop a vaccine. We felt that we could have gone faster had we had a few more plans in place, but um, we thought this was um, a reasonable shot at getting a vaccine into clinical testing pretty quickly. 
But what's really important is because we have so much knowledge of this technology already. Once we'd started the first clinical trial, we were able to move on very, very quickly. So our first clinical trial data was published in July. This clinical trial had 1,077 participants and half of them had received the Chalux-1 NCOV-19 vaccine and half of them received a different vaccine, which is a vaccine against meningitis. Um, so obviously this isn't going to give you an immune response that will be protective against the coronavirus, but we wanted our subjects to be blinded and not to know which vaccine they had received. And if we give people a saline placebo, they will have no sore arm, no feverishness that you would normally expect from a vaccine. And so they wouldn't necessarily know, I'm sorry, they, they may necessarily know which vaccine they'd received and we didn't want them to, to understand which vaccine they'd had. We also had a small group where we gave them two shots of the vaccine to see if that would increase the immune response. And we found the usual adverse events, as they're called after vaccination. People had um, feeling of feverishness, um, sometimes chills, muscle ache, headache, lasting uh, one to two days in most cases. And we also discovered that giving people paracetamol at the time of vaccination over the first 24 hours reduced these side effects somewhat and they were better tolerated. There were no serious adverse events. Um, and we also found that in the group who had a, two doses, the reactionicity was less after the second dose. Uh, so this publication came out in July. So apart from the reactionicity data, we're looking at the immune responses and we look at a few different measures of immune response. These are the IgG responses, the so-called binding antibodies. And in the group that received the meningitis vaccine, over time, we see no change in the ability of these people to make antibodies that bind the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Some of them had antibodies at the time we started the study. Um, we had quite a few healthcare workers in the study and some of them were already seropositive, but there was no change over the time that we followed them. Whereas in the group that received the coronavirus vaccine, you can see a, a big increase um, starting on day 14 and increasing up to day 28. And all of the subjects in this trial made a good antibody response against the coronavirus spike protein, which didn't immediately drop away. We still see it there 56, week, 56 days sorry, later, and we will continue to follow these volunteers. These are just coming up to their six month follow up time point now. So we'll soon have more data on the durability of these responses. We saw that in the subjects that we gave two doses to, we actually got an increased antibody response. And we don't know what level of antibodies people need to protect them against the coronavirus. So the best that we can do for now is to compare them to the antibodies that we find in the serum of people who've uh, recovered from coronavirus infections. And that's what's shown on the right hand side here. So each um, light green square is uh, the level of antibody in somebody who's recovered from a mild infection of SARS-CoV-2. The dark green squares are those who had a more severe infection. They tend to have higher antibody responses. And then uh, the ones that are shown as red stars are the ones that I'm going to show you as controls on the next slide, which is where we're looking at neutralizing antibodies. And those are the ones shown here. So neutralizing antibodies are the ones that can bind onto the virus, onto um, the, the spike protein and block it infecting human cells. So if we had a, a strong neutralizing antibody titer, we can prevent the virus from cause, causing infection in the person who's been vaccinated. And what we saw is that after people had received two doses of the vaccine, they um, have a neutralizing antibody titer, which is very similar to people who'd had PCR confirmed COVID infection. And it's higher than the, the neutralizing antibody titers that you find in, in healthcare workers who'd had an asymptomatic infection. These were people who didn't report having COVID. They hadn't had a PCR positive result, but when we tested them, we found that they did have some antibodies and they, they therefore were exposed and had an asymptomatic infection. So the vaccine is giving people neutralizing antibody responses after one dose, increasing after two doses. And this appears to be a similar level to people who've already been in, um, infected and recovered and would be expected to be protected at least in the short term. We measure the T cell responses as well. So we're looking for two types of T cell response, those that support the antibody response and give us a long-term durable antibody response and those that are capable of recognizing and killing virus infected cells uh, and destroying the ability of the virus to spread throughout the body. And again, with the meningitis vaccine group, there was no change over time, but in the group that received the chalux one ncov 19 vaccine, we saw an increase in their T cell responses strongest 14 days after vaccination, but this time there was no increase when we gave people a second dose. 
So from the phase one trials we've extended into um, older adults, it's really important for SARS-CoV-2 to understand the immune response to vaccination in people over the age of 55 years. Uh, and we have two other age groups, 56 to 69 and 70 plus. Uh, and we should be publishing some data on the immune response in these older age groups um, in the coming weeks. That, that paper should be coming out quite soon. Um, we've also conducted a phase three trial. So this is 10,000 people in the UK now, adults over the age of 18 years um, with no upper age limit. We extended our phase three studies into Brazil. It's really important to test vaccines in different geographical locations because people around the world because of race and because of exposure to different micro, microorganisms in the environment can make different responses to vaccines. So we need to understand that. So we have another trial of 10,000 subjects running in Brazil and a further trial with 2,000 people in South Africa. And in South Africa, we also have an HIV positive cohort, which is one of the special populations that we need to study the vaccine in to understand the risk benefit um, of the vaccine in that particular population before deciding whether it should be used in more widespread in that population. Uh, and of course, AstraZeneca are now um, sponsoring uh, a 30,000 subject phase three trial in the US of adults 18 years and over. And in all of these, they're randomized to receive either the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine or either the meningitis vaccine or a saline placebo. And in all of these trials, the majority of participants will receive two doses because we know that gives us the strongest immune response that we can get with this vaccine. So we're a university, we can do vaccine research, we can do this early uh, manufacturing at a small scale and clinical development, but we're never going to be able to manufacture on a large scale and uh, distribute the vaccine for global supply. So we needed a partner to do that for us. And we were very pleased in April to form a partnership with AstraZeneca, who like Oxford, have a strong commitment to broad and equitable supply of the vaccine throughout the world. Uh, and we'll do this at no profit throughout the pandemic. It's very important to understand that we won't be protected from outbreak pathogens until we have protection around the world. Protect, using a vaccine to protect one country doesn't protect that country because the, vac the virus will keep coming back from different parts of the world. And so we need to protect the vulnerable populations throughout the world. Um, AstraZeneca have a, an exclusive license to this vaccine from Oxford, but they have set up a, a network of uh, manufacturing partners and clinical trial sites in order to achieve a truly global response. What we're going to need for vaccine licensure before the vaccine can be rolled out for use is first of all, the efficacy result from one or more of the phase three trials. And we don't yet have our efficacy result, but we've been hearing the very exciting news earlier this week that Pfizer have now determined the efficacy um, of their vaccine, at least at the first interim analysis, and showing that it's more than 90% effective in stopping um, symptomatic PCR positive infections, which is what you count in these phase three trials. So that's a really big breakthrough because it wasn't known that it was definitely possible to make a vaccine against this coronavirus. We've always expected that it would be possible because there are licensed vaccines against veterinary coronaviruses. It's not a, a very difficult virus like HIV to make vaccines against. But now we have evidence that it is possible to make a vaccine that will protect people from this infection. Uh, but we're going to need more than one vaccine to protect the world. Pfizer are projecting they may be able to make, I think it's 1.3 billion doses of their vaccine by the end of 2021. And with 7 billion people in the world and that vaccine being used in two doses, we're going to need other vaccines to, to um, add to that. So first of all, we need our efficacy data. Then we need to establish safety and immunogenicity of the vaccine in multiple populations. Uh, we've already started to test an HIV positive cohort in South Africa and now also in the UK. We won't start to immunize children until we have evidence of efficacy in adults. But once we have that, we expect to move on to vaccinate children but because there are some children who are particularly at high risk of respiratory infections. And even if it's not going to be very widely used in children, it's important to understand the safety and immune response in children so that it can be used in people under the age of 18 years. And pregnant women, again, important a group to include First of all, we have to do the reproductive toxicology studies, and then we will be able to move into um, the careful vaccination of pregnant women in clinical trials, possibly sometime next summer. And finally, we need regulatory approval for emergency use. 
So once we have our efficacy data, our safety data, our immunogenicity data in different populations, we put all of this information in front of the regulators and they will decide if the vaccine should be rolled out and used. So I've talked to you about what we uh, contributed to the response to Ebola, how we're trying to develop vaccines against Nipah and Lassa and MERS. Um, I didn't have time to talk about Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever today, but that's another disease that infects livestock and humans get infected uh, when they're exposed to those infective livestock. It's carried by ticks and it tends to spread um, in a way which is really quite difficult to track, but it's spreading from Eastern Europe ever closer to the UK with every year that goes by. So in order to plan for the future, we need to think about the diseases of livestock that also infect humans. Um, sometimes these diseases in livestock cause economic issues and sometimes they don't. And when they don't, it's very difficult to persuade people to vaccinate the livestock uh, because the risk is not to the livestock, it's to the people who work with them. And then there's the risk that the infection will spread wider in the population. Um, but by working on vaccines for livestock together with vaccines on human, we can save time um, and it helps to be able to, um, to do co-development uh, because we can test vaccines in livestock as well as testing them in humans. We need to continue to address all the bottlenecks so that we can achieve truly rapid vaccine development. And we also need to think about all the aspects of the vaccine technologies that we're using, not just the ability to go very fast at the beginning. We need to think about the storage requirements. Do these require ultra low temperatures or can they simply be refrigerated or even stored at ambient temperatures? What scale can they be manufactured at? A vaccine that's highly effective, but we can only make a million doses a year is not going to go very far. Um, ideally, we would see very strong immune responses after one dose, even if we can improve those responses after a second dose. And we also want to see it, um, immune responses that last a long time so that we're not having to reboost people um, in many times a year. Uh, and we would hope to be able to boost people every two, three, or even five years um, if we can get truly durable responses. So while we're working on our response to this pandemic, we're also thinking about plans for a new Oxford Centre for Pandemic Preparedness. Plans are at a fairly early stage at the moment. We're talking to um, Peter Horby's group who ran the recovery trial, uh, testing drugs for use in the pandemic uh, with extremely good results. Their result on dexamethasone has now saved many, many lives around the world. And that trial has also shown which drugs really don't work against this particular infection. Um, and so we're beginning to put together some plans to have a better response to pandemics in the future. Um, but at the moment, we're all fairly busy still working on our response to this pandemic. So that's something that's going to take a little bit longer to develop. So I'm going to stop there and um, I'll take some of your questions now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, Diving straight into the most uh, bit up question. Uh, given the high effic efficacy rates of Pfizer and the Novavax UK protocol allowing an unplanned early look at the data, is there a case to take an early look uh, at your data? I wasn't unplanned. Um, that was their first interim analysis. It is extremely carefully planned. Um, so there is a statistical analysis plan for each clinical trial that's running and those plans are discussed in advance with the regulators. So um, what triggers the, the look at the data is uh, reaching a certain number of endpoints. So an endpoint is when a subject in the trial has been symptomatic and then tests PCR positive. And the number of people that applies to is counted up. Um, and in Pfizer's case, um, by the time they um, looked at the data, they had 94 of those cases. And then what the statisticians do is work out um, whether those 94 people had the coronavirus vaccine or the placebo, and then that allows you to determine the vaccine efficacy. We also have a statistical analysis plan. Uh, we will have a first interim analysis, and we hope that that will read out before the end of the year. But um, there's no point in having an unscheduled look at the data. That just gives mm. us a situation in which we can't apply for regulatory approval. And if the interim analysis is neither positive or negative, um, will it be announced? Um, no, if the interim analysis is not conclusive, then the not trial conclusive. will continue until more endpoints have accumulated and then there'll be a further analysis. So it's possible to um, have a positive result, 
a negative result or no result and then to continue and eventually you, you can reach the point where it becomes futile to continue um, uh, but we obviously are hoping for a positive result from our trial. Okay, great, thank you. Um, from, a question from Omer. Uh, what is the anticipated interaction of vaccine-induced immune response with therapeutic molecules? Uh, if we're talking about monoclonal antibodies, um, I think that there won't really be any interaction between those uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies and those induced by vaccination. So in some people uh, who are perhaps elderly, who have a compromised immune system, it may be more beneficial rather than attempting to vaccinate them to give them a dose of antibodies. Uh, and AstraZeneca are also working on monoclonal antibodies which are antibodies that recognize and bind, neutralize the spike protein of the coronavirus. But those antibodies have been engineered to be very long lasting in the body so that you can give a dose of them and they will last for a long time. This is obviously much more expensive than vaccination. Um, it can't be rolled out on such a wide scale, but for the small part of the population who really aren't capable of making a strong and protective immune response, that is another way to protect them. Thank you. A uh, question from uh, Lynn Cox. Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the age of the oldest person you're testing? Do you think that immunosenescence uh, will reduce vaccine efficacy in the very old, 85 plus? I'm not sure. I think we have somebody around about the age of 90. I don't get the data on the volunteers, but we, we do have people certainly in their, in their late 80s in this trial and in earlier trials as well. And we will be looking at the immune response um, and correlating it with age when we unblind the study. Um, yes, at, at some point uh, we will uh, find uh, people who are no longer competent to respond to vaccination, but uh, we will also be looking at uh, responses in people slightly younger than that and trying to determine whether this vaccine will be a good candidate for protecting them. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned in uh, that Lassa fever had multiple lineages. Uh, is there any evidence to suggest that this coronavirus is, uh, has multiple lineages? No, not so far. We have different species of coronaviruses. So we have the four um, seasonal human coronaviruses that give us a cold um, that can come around every year and we know that we frequently get reinfected with those and long-term immunity is not very good and then there's SARS and MERS and now SARS-CoV-2. Um, there are mutations accumulating in SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's not at a very rapid rate. We need to keep an eye on it because this drift of the, of the genetics may mean that we uh, find there are new virus isolates that are less susceptible to the immune response we're getting from vaccination. But it's not um, at the stage where we have with Lassa, where there are really quite different virus um, lineages out there. Okay, perhaps uh, one more question then, um, if uh, from Laura Walker. If many different vaccines are made with the chimpanzee virus, won't we become immune to it after we have been vaccinated against COVID? making it ineffective as a basis for uh, further different vaccines? Well, that's something that we track in the clinical trials. So we measure the anti-vector antibodies as well as the anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. We've engineered the um, adenovirus to make the, the vaccine antigen, in this case, the spike protein at very, very high level. And we've uh, recently published a paper in collaboration with David Matthews from Bristol that shows that the majority of the protein that's made after we vaccinate somebody is actually the spike protein. And so the majority of the immune response is directed against that spike protein. There aren't very many adenoviral proteins being made, and so we don't get a very strong response against them. Um, so we're already seeing that if we give two doses of the vaccine four weeks apart, we, we increase the immune response, which wouldn't happen if we had an overwhelming anti-adenovirus response. And we also see that over time, and, and we've done this with other vaccine trials in earlier years, the anti-vector response declines quite rapidly as well. So although we do get some antibodies against the vaccine vector itself, it's at a much lower level than we get to the vaccine antigen, and it really doesn't seem to pose any problems. Of course, we wouldn't propose using Chadox-1 for vaccines that are five or six different vaccines that people are going to receive. But remember for outbreak pathogens, most of them are quite widely separated and you wouldn't be expecting to receive vaccines against multiple outbreak pathogens. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so I think I'll hand over to Jim now. Uh, hi, Sarah. Um, I've got the great honor and pleasure of sort of virtually handing you uh, the first award for person of the year from Longevity Forum, which I think you've probably got somewhere near you. No, don't show it quite yet, because I'm no, going no, to say no, one or two words before <laughs> the, it's like the Oscars, but it'll be a very, very mm -hmm. quick one. Um, you've probably got I hope you've got a very large mantelpiece because in the next two or three years, you're going to be getting lots of awards, but it, it really gives us from the Longevity Forum and from Juvenescence, which is the principal sponsor this year of the Longevity Forum, such great pleasure to give it to you. And I think your passion, your dedication and your uh, belief that every single person on the planet should get this uh, treatment or get a a treatment to eradicate this scourge that has destroyed so many lives, uh, so many hopes, so many opportunities, and has caused us all uh, great angst. And uh, I mean, it's been unprecedented in history, as we all know. Uh, your efforts in particular shine through and your passion shines through. And we're really, really grateful that you've taken the time to give us this really fantastic lecture, which I'm sure we do many thousands of times um, subsequent to this particular uh, evening. And so it's, as I said, my great honor to hand you virtually and hopefully one day to meet you and celebrate in person the first Person of the Year award by the Longevity Forum. And hopefully next year, um, the because of your efforts, the next honoree will be able to get it uh, sort of physically. And uh, so if you wouldn't mind just showing what the award is, it has... Uh, multiple uses. It could probably be used for, you know, sort of uh, timing um, uh, oh, No, it doesn't show so very forth. well against the background. And, um, <laughs> it is a very large um, sort of uh, egg timer, I suppose. Um, and <laughs> it's got your name on it. And uh, hopefully um, it will be the first, it will be the first of very many awards. So we want to thank you so much, Sarah, for everything you've done for us and for the world. So. A virtual round of applause, starting with me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think I'd need an ostrich egg to go with, with the egg timer, though, because it's <laughs> going to take quite a long time to go through that. OK, thanks, Sarah. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, and uh, um, see you all soon. Thank you.